Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try and get this done in eight minutes, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk fast. Um, we're in the midst of an existential crisis. According to the United Nations Sustainable Development Report of 22, cascading and interlocked crises are putting the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in grave danger, along with humanity's own very own survival. The Western extractivist framing of natural elements as resources, conceptualized during the period of the so-called Enlightenment, is enabled through a vision of the universe which is anthropocentric, centering human existence and simultaneously disenfranchising all other than human existences. My research proposes that a recalibration of this vision is necessary as one of the processes required to mitigate these crises. The United Nations offers a definition of global citizenship as membership of multiple diverse local and non-local networks rather than single actors affecting isolated societies. In order to decenter our human experience, we must extend this membership to the other than human elements of our planet, understanding that this will more fully recognize our global ecologies as the totality or pattern of relations between organisms and their environment. This shared planetary citizenship has always been the lived experience of indigenous cultures and is beginning to be reflected in new legislation such as that recognizing the personhood of Te Awa Whanganui, the, the Whanganui River in Aotearoa, New Zealand. If we're to expand on this acknowledgement and honoring of our non-human kin, it seems plausible that we must truly see them. When visual strategies offer agency and visibility to other than human phenomenon, I suggest that this witnessing can catalyze advocacy in the service of the natural world. Photography is inextricably bound through theory and practice to the notion of visibility and the implications of impacts of becoming visible are not universally positive. Predating its actualization by centuries, scientists, alchemists, artists and philosophers dreamt of obtaining the ability to fix an image. The language of the darkroom underlines this desire, the colloquial terms for chemistry required to halt development of the negative or print and that required to prevent it degrading are stop and fix. This process of fixing of the photographic subject has been described in evidential, indexical and melancholic terms by a variety of theorists. Roland Barthes states that in photographs there's always a defeat of time, that is dead and that is going to die. Film theorist André Bazin speaks of the preservation of a moment in a photograph as an embalming and Sontag links the indexical properties of a photograph with that of a death mask. Sontag has much else to say about the negative impacts of being fixed in a photograph. In On Photography, she discusses the voyeuristic and exploitative potential of the lens and the ways in which photographs have inured us to post-colonial, violent and capitalist traumas, such as I have shown. Photographs contain within their fixed nature the potential to re-inscribe that trauma. As an example, we can think about the Zeely daguerreotypes. In 1850, Louis Agassiz, a prominent Harvard professor and zoologist, commissioned the coerced set of portraits as part of a study intended to demonstrate the inferiority of black people. The enslaved subjects of the daguerreotypes were stripped to the waist and documented, fixed. Since 1976, when the images resurfaced, they've been reclaimed through, through the art of black photographer Carrie Mae Weems, and now in the ongoing legal efforts of the descendant of two of the subjects, Tamara Lantier, who wishes to have the images removed from public display and returned to their families. Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, associate professor at Harvard, states, the Zeely daguerreotypes offer a clear, chilling example of how representation and vision have been structured and conditioned in a representative democracy built on an ideal of freedom that was constructed, supported, and enriched by the thoroughgoing support of enslaved labor on stolen indigenous land. These tensions and complexities characterize the medium of photography and inform its slippery nature. Through processes of lens-based and lensless photographic imaging, many practitioners are investigating degrees of visibility in relation to the more than human citizens of the world. Can a photographic practice that is based on observation and documentation avoid rendering its subjects transparent and thus exposing them to a colonizing gaze, even when that subject is other than human? 
How can strategies of opacity and empath empathetic listening be imparted to a lens-based practice? If we attend to the history of photography of the land, we can trace the Western project of enclosure, privatization, invasion, and commodification through visual approaches that continue sublime and picturesque traditions, situating our environment as separate from ourselves. The photographic apparatus has been complicit in early land survey photographs, aerial reconnaissance and surveillance images, ruin porn, and the online circulation. Missed a slide. <laughs> Online cir circulation of travel and landscape imagery as proof of lifestyle. Edouard Glisson calls for a right to opacity as protection against the acquisitive and commodifying gaze of the project of the West. The power of this opacity lies in its anti colonial force and therefore its resistance to certain senses of knowing and understanding that would seek to absorb, reactivate, and possess. However, opacity is a state to be worked for and achieved, an active verb rather than a passive noun. How then can lens-based practitioners who wish to work into a space of partial and resistant opacity operate in a field where advancing technology and market are constantly agitating for more and sharper vision? A range of lens-based and filmic practices explore approaches to this protective state of partial, incomplete or occluded vision and I'll offer a very brief and selective survey of some of them. Might even have to be briefer than I think it will be. And Jane says, and I'm an old phenomenon, two projects by Anne Shelton. Shelton utilizes stand-ins for the representation of erased and marginalized human narratives and plant knowledge. Shelton has long eschewed human representation in her photographs as a tactic to prevent a reinscribing of unwanted or unintended stereotypes and biases onto her subjects. For the last decade, Shelton's worked extensively with plant knowledge sourced from alternative and repressed histories of female reproduction, contraception, and healing, utilizing aesthetic principles of Ikebana and still life and augmenting her images with passages of parafictional text and long informational captions, Shelton asks us to see the invisible, marginalized, and persecuted women she summons through her beautifully crafted and staged images. How am I going? A minute. <laughs> Straight. All right. Uh, Claire Hewitt's most recent body of work, which I'm skipping quickly through now, Everything in the Forest is the Forest, visualizes the multi multiplicity and connective entanglements of the forest ecology as a model for human interconnectedness. This project has emerged out of a long-form collaboration with a set of oak trees, and her outputs utilize both scientific and poetic methodologies. I could tell you more about them, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Skipping on to uh, Kate Vanderdrift, who's another artist from Aotearoa. Uh, and in this series of works, she embarks on a process of co-creation with the Waikato River to create latent photographic images on color negative emulsion over the period of a lunar cycle. Very briefly, the Waikato River in pre-contact times was a pristine waterway running through hectares of 2,000-year-old kahikatea trees is now in serious decline due to dairy industry, all the usual reasons. Um, <clears throat> each large-scale painterly print is made from a scanned 5x4 color-negative piece of film that has been immersed in the silty depths of the river for a month where all the traces of human and other than human life can coalesce. So to conclude, in my research, I'm interested in exploring and pushing the boundaries of the overlapping and interdisciplinary potential of tools such as environmental science, indigenous knowledge, philosophy, and art. Through these methodologies, I suspect, suggest, suspect and suggest, that lens-based practitioners can operate in ways that do not perpetuate ocular violence upon their other than human subjects. Rather, their outcomes can advocate and mobilize for a greater respect and care for that environment. Thank you very much. Yes, you did nail it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Um, I'd just like to ask you about the impact of your work, because I know that's something that you're working on developing, so I wonder if you want to share some of your um, goals. 
Well, that's a complicated question because I'm a practice-based researcher, so uh, in my research and my own making and the making of others is all bound up together. So in terms of singular impact, I don't know if I can answer that, but collectively, uh, it's massive. <laughs> so uh, what my hope is to, is to pull together the global south and north through these artists that I'm referencing and, and pull together their research into one space so that we can have some trans-hemispherical conversations. So that's that's the impact I'm hoping to have in the short term anyway with, with this research. Does that answer that? Brilliant, thank you. Yes, yeah. it does, yeah. yeah. And also, just a comment, that I, I love the fact that with your work and the work of other people that you, you see that the, the trees and the, and the rivers and so on as, as kind of partners in your research and stakeholders. And I think that's a really kind of novel idea and I really like it. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Okay, thanks. Is there any other questions? Thanks yep. very much. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to get back to my assessments now. I'm really sorry. It's very rude. No, thank you for spending time, Becky. Thank you.